If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. So uh, in this episode of Mind Pump, we had Larry Hagner on from the Dad Edge podcast. He actually came and visited us. We were on his show, um, and then he was on ours. And uh, he's got a podcast about how to be a good father, how to be a good man, a good father. I really like this 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 trend that seems to be coming out, right, mm. with these podcasts. Well, there's or- a big need for it right yeah. now. Yeah. You can see that there's a, there's a need for this that I feel like, you know, and he kind of touches on this in the podcast that – Men just have a really hard time asking for help, you know, admitting they need help. Dude, we know this well, as trainers. Like, you know how hard it would be for like yeah. you to get male clients sometimes because they're right. going to come ask you? And it's even hard for men to just have open conversations with other men other than, you know, extreme situations like you're in war or like, you know, like you're 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 in battle, you're in like, a, you know, sports. Or and drunk. Like, or drunk. Yeah. And then it really comes I out. I love so, you, man. Yeah, for people to now openly talk about, I think it's very therapeutic. Well, he does a good job of, of humanizing himself, right? Yeah. By no means does he claim to be an expert at being an expert father no. or have all the answers, it, but he provides some really solid guests and he kind of rattles off some of the people that he's had on the show. He's, he's got had some a, really good guests. Yeah, he's had some great authors and great guys and friends of ours that we're, we have a lot of mutual friends. It is it is interesting that a lot of people who are doing this, these kind of things, these movements, these podcasts about being a better father, a lot of it comes from the fact that they didn't have mm-hmm. that role model. And he goes into that in his life. Is and, and one of the reasons why he started this was to help himself out, help himself grow. He had become a new father. And, you know, for it's scary for first of all, it's scary being a parent first time for anybody, male and female. Yep. But if you're a if you're a, a, a man and then you're having kids and you didn't have that strong, you know, positive father role model, I can only imagine how much more terrifying it would be um, the part of the, you know, Adam and him actually connected quite a bit over some of that. And Yeah, I think he was surprised by it. I think he was, uh, yeah. wasn't was sure what to ask me because I don't have any kids. Yeah. That was on his show, yeah. Right, right. And then he led with the, the dogs and stuff like that. But then, uh, you know, there's a reason why I'm not. And those of you guys that are, you know, been listening to Mind Pump for a really long time and maybe have not heard that that de- I think it got a little bit deeper on his yeah. show. Mm. I think you got it even more personal, which was great to hear. And I think people would appreciate that to listen to that episode too on his podcast. Yeah, but he's a, he's a good guy, really good guy. He's doing a good thing. He's got great guests on his show. So go make sure make sure you check out his podcast, the Dad Edge Podcast. Uh, you can also find his website, which is gooddadproject.com forward slash alliance that's the dad edge alliance um and then on instagram it's the dad edge or at the dad edge facebook the dad edge group and uh and that's pretty much it uh, i also do want to mention this month maps performance is 50 percent off so this is the maps program that we we originally designed mass performance for the for the functional training crossfit type crowd you know back in those days when we first started the show we would criticize the some of the exercise workout programming mm. of you know CrossFit fit boxes. People said, "Hey, if you guys right. are criticizing it, what would you how, guys do?" Yeah, how would you do it differently? And yeah. so we, we had to really like you know collectively put our efforts in that direction of what that looked like. So, so maps per, was. maps performance is like I mean you have a, so, a solid strength component, you have a solid mobility component, you have a stamina component, an explosive power and speed and agility co- component. It's literally trying to turn you into the ultimate all-around athlete. It's a yeah. must program for all dads. A yeah. lot of rotational stuff going on when you got to pick up kids up off the floor yeah, and run man. around with them kids still, and you're a 35, 40-year-old strength. Man. That's right. right. You want to yeah. be a badass. It's a mandatory program. But it's 50% off. You have to use the code GREEN50. That's green, the word green, and the number 50, no space, at mindpumpmedia.com. On that site, you can also find a lot of our other p- programs and bundles. Bundles are where we take multiple math programs and put them together and then discount them, like our super bundle, which is a year of exercise program. So all of that, including math performance at 50% off with the code GREEN50, can be found at mindpumpmedia.com. And without any further ado, here we are interviewing Larry Hagner, the host of the Dad Edge podcast. Ah! Oh, dude, Larry can't beat you, dude. It's his first day here. Second. <laughs> Third. 
Again, Justin? Yeah. Uh, Whatever, dude. You guys. Uh, just get used to last place, bro. Listen. Uh, uh. Get used to last place. I'm going to give you guys as many wins as I can so you feel good about yourself. I saw what you did on your Insta story you know I mean? yesterday with the men's physique pose, like the subtle. That's not a men's that physique. Was what are you totally, talking totally about? Totally was like, Is a, it? like a little side like. Did lesson. he really? I was, did. I was just you have angled your a little bit. Wait, hold on. Did you have your shirt no, on? No, no. His shirt was no, on. His shirt was no. on. But, yeah. he, you know, he got all the all the compliments. I saw all of them. Like, oh, oh my God. Oh, yeah. I did see to win this, he looks so good. Yeah. Like I see what I, you, see, I see what you did. I wasn't even your flexing. Fans. I wasn't posing. That's natural. Yeah. You, get, you guys want that to hear just a quick shows how story. awesome. Yeah, I yeah, tell us a story. Yeah. Okay, so my wife, who's in studio with us today, she was like, "Where are we going?" I was like, "Oh, we're gonna we're gonna go on Mind Pump podcast. It's like literally one of the biggest podcasts on iTunes." She's like, "Well, have you met these guys? Do you know what they're?" I was like, "No, I haven't met them yet." But I was like, "Hold on." So I went. I, I Googled and a picture of Sal came up. And he's, I was like, this is one of them. She's like, oh. <laughs> She's like, I'll sit in for this podcast. Yeah. <laughs> that's a lot. That's a, that's a lot of blue steel. That's a lot like, of Photoshop. Yeah. A lot of Photoshop yeah. on that picture. No, don't lie. It's not uh, Photoshop. No, Although, not. you know, what's funny. Sal's the master of lighting. I the, think. Yeah, no, and angles. He's yeah. like Mr. Angles and lighting. I remember the one of the first critiques that we got after the show had been going for a while. And, you know, we talk about. And Sal shares a lot about being all natural and dieting and eating and, and overall health. And one of the critiques we got was someone saying that, who's the guy with all the, all the anabolic yeah. steroids in the picture? Because they think he's on steroids. It, <laughs> That's no. got to be such a rad compliment. No, you know no, I mean? no. It's just yeah. raviolis. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is, those are not ravioli sure, abs for sure. Yeah. Yeah. But so, so, Larry, tell us yeah. a little bit about your yourself and your podcast. You have an interest. In, there seems to be this growing market for you know podcasts and media dedicated to uh, helping men navigate what it what it means to be a man and helping to be a men father. Be, helping men be men. Yeah, right. and how to yeah. be fathers. Like you how know, to so, have character. Yeah, tell us about how that all started and then I want to ask you like why you think that market seems to be growing. Yeah, so I started I, I founded the Good Dad Project back in 2012 and literally it be, it came out of struggle. Like struggle because I struggled just like all of us guys do with fatherhood and uh, you know you live this quiet life of desperation as we always call it. So 2012 I started that. Uh, it, it was a Facebook page and then 2013 I started the blog uh, GoodDadProject.com and then in 2015 I launched uh, my first book uh, which is called The Dad's Edge and I also launched uh, the Good Dad Project podcast at the time and then I mean the podcast has been around now for three and a half years in January I changed it from Good Dad Project to The Dad Edge it just seemed uh, you know from a if, if we're talking marketing and business and and men who really want to dive into certain content. What I've noticed about men in general is whatever they're listening to, and I'm sure you guys know this, especially men, especially dads, they have to feel cool doing it. Mm. Like it has to be a part of them. So like if you look at like actually the the logo, it's it's a Spartan shield, you know, and that's what the dad edge is. And really that's, that's what we talk about. We help men become better men. And a byproduct is, is they become a better father. The byproduct of that is become, they become a better husband. They become a better business owner. Um, but that's I, my podcast really started because to be honest, I'm, I'm just as a, a much of a moron father as the next guy. And I just decided, I was like, I'm going to be, I'm going to be a student of this. I just want to learn. And the podcast allows me to talk to men who and guests who are just way smarter than me. So the podcast has really become uh, just a platform of, of me learning and then sharing what it is I'm learning. So when you first started, was it a, a business strategy to do it? Or did you look at it more like scratching your own itch? Like this is something that I, I just for that exact reason, I can get to touch people that I like, probably wouldn't be in contact yeah, with. Like yeah, like a hobby or yeah. What were you doing previous to that? To me, well, so I have uh, medical device sales, so I, I was doing that, and uh, it was it was B. It was really just scratch my own itch because I was just like, I just want to figure this out. There was no intention whatsoever of making a business out of it, and uh, I'm proud to say it's it's a it's thriving now. It's doing really really well, but it all came out of struggle. Mm. That, I, you know, a lot of times, like what drove, for example, what drives a lot of people in fitness, um, especially people who are in fitness for a long period of time, is because they're dealing with their own either health issues or insecurities. I know what motivated me when I first started working out was a very skinny. I felt inadequate, so I want to learn how to build muscle. I want to learn how to train and, and, and drive those things. 
why what drove you to do this for dads and for men did you have good role models growing up that were fathers or did you feel like you 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 lacked that and this was something that you wanted to create for people like who were in situations like your own yeah so i'll, I'll share my background cuz I, I think it definitely gives a lot of context to what and why so my mom and biological father were married in 1971. They had me in 1975, nine months after I was born. My mom and dad broke up. They split up, and he was gone. Uh, when I was four, my mom married my stepdad. Uh, I didn't know my father, had no recollection of him whatsoever. And so this will be a funny story for you guys. When I was four, I'll never forget this. So I was in preschool, and I always remember like these guys coming in to pick up their kids and I knew what a dad was. However, I knew that I didn't have one. So I'll never forget the first time my mom brought a guy home to have dinner with us. And she'd been working with this guy. So this guy walks in. He's got the 1970s three-piece suit on, the mustache, the briefcase, because there was no iPads back then or anything like that. <laughs> Trench coat comes in. And my mom's like, hey, this is Joe. And I shook his hand. At four years old, I still remember this to this day. I said, are you going to be my dad? Oh, <laughs> like, wow. <laughs> wow. Awkward moment for your yeah. mom real quick. <laughs> I just remember like, it just went quiet yeah. in the yeah. room after that. So, you know, they laughed about it. But a year later, they did get married. And what I can say about him was is he was a very nice guy, probably one of the nicest guys you ever want to meet. However, he had just a dark side. He was a huge drinker. And it was a Jekyll and Hyde situation. When he drank, man, you know, it, you know Adam, I know it, you've, we, we talked before this and, and you shared your story. It, it, was, it was six years of absolute hell, like – uh, mental, physical abuse. My mom and him, you know, beat on each other. He would beat on me. I was, you know, choked and strangled and pushed. Wow, we out. have a very similar story there. Yeah. And even to the point yeah. of what you're sharing right now with how he, my stepfather, I was seven though, when he came walking the door, only he came in with a mustache and permed blonde hair and wow. rolled, rolled up in his IROC Z. Oh. <laughs> so he was, wow. uh, and he uh, was a carpenter. Yeah. yeah, right. So yeah. he was, a, but he was a good looking guy. And everybody loved him. I mean, and I, I to actually still have a relationship with him to today too uh so but he definitely had i mean when you meet him he just seems like an amazing amazing guy yeah but him and my mom were just and what i've grown and i don't know if you're similar in this way is you know i i kind of blame the both of them right like i don't i don't think that he was as a kid i was you know old, evil bad stepfather you know and the abuse and stuff as i got older i saw that my mom was responsible for just as much of the ugliness and abuse too and so i think they were just toxic together they oh, were yeah. just awful together right i can definitely say that probably about my mom and her her relationships that she had because there was always a guy in the picture and it was whether she was married or not she went on to be married uh three times total every guy just had his bag of issues you know just toxic alcoholic you know it was it was just it was it was pretty chaotic growing up. I always say that half my childhood was spent without a father figure, and the other half was spent with with a toxic one. And I don't I don't say that out of pity. In fact, you know, I, I give gratitude to my background now, uh, just because it's you know it's it was a, it was a great learning experience of, of what not to do. Right. Uh, but I will say this: uh, I did meet my biological father for the first time, and just for the sake of time, I won't go into how. But um, I did meet him when I was twelve. And I never had a relationship with him. I had an opportunity to meet him and we kind of hung out for a few months. And then we had a conversation a few months later and, you know, hey, uh, I'm married again. You know, I have a two-year-old son. I have another son on the way. Uh, it, my life is complicated. Mm. So we ended up going our separate ways. And that was really tough because my mom had just gotten divorced. I, you know, ran into my biological father, lost him again. And then, you know, like I said, my mom married a couple more times and it was always a disaster. The The tail end of this story really started when I was 30. So when I was 30, I had my first son who's 12 now and I met my biological father again. It was crazy, crazy, crazy. Mm. Like right after you had your kid or oh, he was, was 12, right, you were 12. That's crazy. Yeah, actually. Yeah. It, yeah. Well, he, well, so yeah, my son's 12 now, but I was 30 when I met my dad, which was 12 years ago, but it was right before I, I met him before my son was born. But, he, but I was sitting in a Starbucks with a friend of mine, a coworker of mine, and we were, we were talking about business and all of a sudden this guy walks into Starbucks and he caught my eye and I just was like, oh, oh shit. It wasn't like a planned meeting. No. Oh, get the fuck out of here. Yeah. yeah. Wow. That it, had to have been crazy. It was crazy. It was nuts. Like, hmm. I mean, my hands kind of sweat even kind of talking about it. Wow. But he, he walked in. I was like, I was like, you're, you're never going to guess who just walked in. And she's like, who? 
And I was like, that's, that's my father. She's like, your father isn't the guy like you've never known. I was like, yeah. it's like in the Starbucks line. Right yeah. Now. <laughs> yeah. And she's like, what are you going to say? And I'm like, like, what's, what does he drink? What's his order? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm just curious. Well, it's it's yeah. funny you say that because like, she's like, what are you going to say? And I was like, uh, nothing. I'm just going to take the, the chicken shit route here and not say anything. Just let him go on his way. She's like, that's your dad. You're not going to go say anything to him. I was like, what am I going to say? I was like, I'm going to get a white mocha. What are you getting? You know, it's like, (laughs) there's nothing you really can say. So she gets up, goes over to him and I'm like, what are you doing? And before, before I could stop her, I see them talking and all of a sudden I see my dad, like he's far away and I see him and like, I can read his lips. He goes, where is he? And he started looking around and he comes over and I'm like, holy shit. Like, I'm like sweating at this point. I'm like, do I leave? Do I go to the bathroom? Do I run away? Like, what do I do? He comes up, he shakes my hand and we start talking. And anyway, long story short, he asked me if I wanted to go out to breakfast later that week. And we did. And here we are, uh, 12 years later and we do have a relationship and he's still married to the same woman he was married to back then. He's been married for 40 years now. I think I have two half brothers. I, uh, that I get along with great. My kids know him as, oh, as wow. grandma and grandpa. I mean, it's, I don't call him dad. It just wouldn't probably serve our relationship mm-hmm. very well, but, uh, we have, we do have a friendship. So, but it, I, I say that because when I became a dad for the first time, I was lost, lost, terrified, zero confidence, no idea what to do. I can honestly tell you, I struggled with it for probably nine years. Um, I even struggled with our marriage. Uh, I just zero confidence. And I did what every other guy did. I sought validation in other things outside of the family. So like I dove into work because, mm-hmm. Hey, that's where I was doing good. My career was going great. I dove into hobbies. I was into martial arts big time back then. Like I'm good at that. I can, I'll go do that. And I just, my balance, you know, was completely off. Now going through that, does that give you empathy for him? And what he went through, probably trying to make that same decision around when you were younger, like 12, when you guys were at, do you have any empathy towards him or do you still hold animosity towards him? Wow, that's a good question. Um, so what I've done in my mind is there, there is that part of me, right? I mean, I, it, there's, maybe it's the animalistic part of me where I look at how he is with you know my brothers and, and I'm just like, damn, like why couldn't we have that growing up? And why did, did, did you leave again when I was 12? There is that part of me. However, I purposely focus on not thinking that way because I feel like it it ruins the present. My dad's 71 years old right now. You know, he, I don't, he's, he's actually in perfect health, still works, still a business owner, very successful entrepreneur. Uh, but I don't, I don't know how much time we have. So I just want to make the time that we have count. But I will say this, and I've, I've, I've told this to my wife who's here in studio. Um, I don't understand what might've happened there because there's nothing that is that bad that would, I would break ties with my mm-hmm. own kids. Mm-hmm. I think being a father for most men is uh, when you first become a dad is challenging, scary. You don't know what to do. And the default, at least for me, and I, I think for a lot of people, the default is when you're, when you're in that situation is you look at the, the, the playbook that your dad created for you or that I, I, you know, I had a father that was present and he was very active in our lives. So I got to go back to that default and be like, okay, I'm scared, but I think I know what I'm doing here. I think I, you know, I'm going to do what my dad did because, you know, we had a good relationship and, but you didn't have that. And so that must've been much more terrifying for you going into fatherhood. Yeah. We call that the blueprint. You know, your, your dad will blueprint, you know, either good or bad examples on you growing up. And I didn't really have one. I will say this though. I had an amazing grandfather, like amazing. And I think, and he was my mom's dad. And I think Mm. what he, he was a man's man and he loved my grandmother. Like he was so affectionate, so complimentary, like literally to the day he died. And I got to see that. So that really helped me tremendously. Like I, my, my wife says all the time that I, I love her. Like my grandfather loved my grandma oh, that's great. and he was just very open about it. Uh, but yeah, I will say this. It, it, it messed with me quite a bit, you know, growing up because I was like, I know what my grandpa did, but that was still my grandpa. Like I didn't, I wasn't with him 24 seven. So in certain situations, a lot of situations, I had no, I had no clue what to do. And that's what I think frustrated me the most. How important do you think it is for, uh, for children to have a male 
role model, uh, you know, to, to have that, that father figure? I think it's, I think it's critical. It's, and if you look at the statistics, I know we were talking about statistics earlier. Uh, if you look at, you know, juvenile delinquency, if you look at drug use, if you look at time in jail, if you look at all these different things, you know, anxiety, depression in the fatherless homes, those, those statistics are skyrocketed without that father figure around. Yeah. It, you know, it's funny when you were, when you were born, you know, back in the, in the mid seventies, the single parent household rate, well, it had already grown. It actually had grown quite a bit. I think since it was, since the sixties, you started to see that spike seventies, eighties, it really started taking off today. Some communities, uh, you know, as much as 70, over 70% of the households are single parent. Now, uh, that a large percentage of that, the majority percentage of that is a absent father. There's definitely households where the, the mother is absent, but it's, it's actually quite rare. I mean, I, I think if when you hear about a mom, you know, leaving her kids, um, people are almost shocked. Like, whoa, that's crazy and that's weird. When we talk about single parent household, we all automatically assume it's the mom that's hanging around because the majority of the time it is. Wh- what's going on? Like, why are guys – because that wasn't like that. It wasn't like that, you know – Five to six decades ago, seven decades ago, like you men stuck around. We we didn't leave. We were there as much as the, you know, almost as much as the moms were. It's it seems like it's an epidemic uh, that's happening. What do you think's going on with that? So I think if you look, I just had a podcast guest on to talk exactly about this and marriage and why. They, so if you look at the resources out there, we have a society of marriage breaking not marriage togetherness. So like, so for instance, there are a gazillion resources out there. If you want to end your marriage, oh, that's, that's easy. <laughs> right. Right. Mm-hmm. There aren't that many resources outside of going to couples counseling to make that marriage in that situation work. So it's just, I think a lot of it has to do with it's the norm now it's easier. There's resources. It just seems to be what it didn't mm-hmm. work out. So we're- on that note, you know, we share a lot on our show, uh, some of the things that we've implemented into our lives, to strengthen our relationships with our partners, you know, and I love that you're you're open, that you've been challenged, and you went through all this. Are there things that you have now implemented into your life or your routine uh, that helps strengthen your guys' dynamic and your relationship uh, that has been a game changer for you that you you share maybe on your podcast? So my wife and I, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, I try not to to fart and then throw the covers over her. That's rule number one. Oh. <laughs> the old Dutch oven. I yeah. told you, Sal, it wasn't brings, a good idea. That brings us together. I told you. <laughs> that brings us together. So I get teased. This is true. So Katrina and I, seven years together, we don't we don't fart in the same room. We don't we don't shit in the same room like we and it's not like They also this. don't have kids. You yeah. just wait yeah. you wait till you have this kids, man. Very good they've point, been, yeah. they've yeah. been saying that forever and she's actually it's crazy because I've always been this way and it's more just out of a respect thing for her. Like, you know, my my <laughs> boys, I love to have them smell my fart, but I think the woman that I sleep with every mm-hmm. night, she probably doesn't enjoy it as she much. She doesn't as they know do. you fully, Adam. Right. right. She doesn't know you so, <laughs> wait, your kids end up farting on her too. We'll so. see. And, we'll see. Know, These guys have been saying that forever. Her, yeah. And her her mom actually tells her all the time that you know, honey, don't let the don't let the guys over at Mind Pump tease you about how you and Adam. She's like, that's a very your father and I were like that our whole life, and and I and it's kept the relationship sexy and this and that. When so you guys talk- have kids, are you going to watch her give childbirth? Probably not. Oh, uh, really? Okay, I was going to say because uh, yeah, if you do, yeah. all kinds of probably, stuff's going to happen. Yeah. Things, yeah. things are there. Yeah, I really don't have a desire to do yeah. that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. I'll wait. I'll see my kid come in like thirty seconds later. <laughs> <Okay. Yeah. laughs> Anyways, continue no, on. Yeah. I just wanted to <laughs> side note there for you. That's okay that you stop farting on your wife. I think yeah. that's a great strategy. That and another rule is never never take a shit with the door open. Just don't yeah. do that. Right. Okay, these right. Are, these are okay things. Private but, time. <laughs> but yeah. but all kidding, all kidding aside. Uh, one thing that we we uh, we can definitely say is, and, and this sometimes goes against what I think married people uh, what, what they believe, because I've put this question out to the community, and I've I've gotten different responses. Uh, are you a parent first, or are you a couple first? Mm. You know, and one thing that we pride ourselves on is we are a couple first Absolutely. and parents second. Mm-hmm. And for some people, it's the other way around. However, the way that Jessica and I look at our relationship is we are the foundation of the house. 
And if we're not taking care of it's, it's a lot like what you guys do. If, if the, if the, if your listener, if your client, if your audience isn't taking care of themselves, usually it's the other things that go to absolute hell if they're not. And that's the same way we look at our relationship. You can't, you can't pour from an empty cup. Exactly. Yeah. Good luck. You'll be pouring nothing, you know? Exactly. Exactly. And no one wants nothing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exactly. So, so that's, that's rule number one. The other thing too is, uh, we respect each other. So Anytime I've known Jess now for 22 years, we've been married today, 15 years. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. And we're in the Mind Pump studio. Uh-huh. How about that? Yeah, it's yeah. a cool anniversary. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully never forget this one. That's right. <laughs> but we um, we fight, we argue respectfully. So I, I can honestly tell you, like our kids have never seen us raise our voices to each other. When we argue, it is at the tone that I'm using right now. It's the same tone that we use. We never name call. We obviously never hit. The other night, we were actually sitting outside on the deck, and we had a slight disagreement, and we were just talking like this. And my 12-year-old goes, are you guys fighting? (laughs) And I was like, we're disagreeing. I was like, but listen up. I was like, this is a really good lesson for you. I was like, because it's okay to disagree. It's actually healthy to disagree. However, when you disagree, you don't have to raise your voice. You don't have to call anybody names. You don't have to do any of that stuff. This is the way to disagree. And he was like, oh, okay, cool. You know, and that's not the way, and I'm sure you're the same way. That's not the way I grew up. Right. I mean, there were pots and pans and crazy stuff thrown, like when there were disagreements. And I feel like guys like us, you you either go that way or you go complete opposite, right? You're, you're exactly right. Either you embrace that and you think that's normal, which is sad for me because this is what I see happening to my two youngest siblings is they're falling into similar patterns as my stepfather and my mother. The two oldest, I think that we were old enough and wise enough to know that this isn't right, this isn't healthy. And so we've chose, you can, you can just tell by our partners even, and we have like the, the our communication, both my sister with her husband and me with Katrina, I mean, that's like, that's rule number one. Like you don't raise your voice, you don't speak down to me. And the real thing behind all that, besides all the rules and stuff, is and this is just across forget partnerships and marriage like this is in life like communication you'll never in in work and in, in relation friendships and just talking to another person when people are calling names or yelling you're not listening no nobody's fucking listening no. so if your desired outcome you know if i'm in a, if you and i are having a conversation and my desired outcome is to get you to see my way me yelling and calling you names will never accomplish that. So if that's my real desired outcome, that is the stupidest way I could go about it. And so I think I tell people that regardless if you're in a marriage or not, when communicating and if you are if you want to be an effective communicator, you have to learn to talk like that. Otherwise, you'll never win. <laughs> exactly. In fact, it does the opposite. Right. The total opposite. Yeah. Yeah. So, so th- those, those are the two big things. Those are definitely the two big things. Uh, yeah, we have to take care of our relationship. And when we argue, you know, we do it respectfully. Uh, the other thing too, th- this is a big one. Uh, we never ever disagree with the other person. If so, if, if Jessica is disciplining one of the boys, cause I have four boys cause I'm crazy like that. Uh, if she's disciplining one of the boys and even if I'm like, wow, I really didn't agree with that move. I am not gonna going to do it in front of them. No, no way. Yeah. And she doesn't do that to me. You know, because I mean, kids are smart, man. They'll play one against the other. So, like for instance, like if they come to me and be like, "Mom, like mom did," I'm like, "If that's what she said, Mm -hmm. that's what it is." And this, she does the same for me. And then behind closed doors, you know, she or I will be like, "Hey, you know, I kind of didn't agree." Never show weakness. And what I mean by that is undermining. Yeah, you guys are a unit. Like that's it. There's no weakness between us. There's no light between us. So. You got a problem. You got a problem. You know, you don't. You disagree with one of us. You disagree with both. Yeah, and is then there, you guys some more things. Yeah, is there some common themes like uh, that that create you know these these sort of things you have to work through? Like uh, you guys have disagreements about. Like I know for me and my wife, we we tend to find like certain themes that like like create conflict, but we kind of know how to navigate now uh, when when it gets brought up. Is there anything like that that you guys go through? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I think there's a few. I have to, I have to think about. We're I gonna know, sell her out. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm like, <laughs> yeah, creating this right now. Yeah. <laughs> I, I know one, uh, and, and it, <laughs> this is why it's such a mind fuck doing the doing the dad edge stuff, because like you always talk about how to be more present, how to be more intentional, mm-hmm. and then there I am while she's talking to me on my phone, mm-hmm. checking Instagram. She's like, it's a big one. Yeah, even listening to me, mm-hmm. and so that's like a big one. Like, so that's one I always have to kind of keep in check. Like, hey you know, be here with us, you know, don't, don't be doing your business. Don't be doing, and it it really screws in my head because like, that is my business is like helping other fathers, 
doing what I'm not doing at Dude, the Dude, talk yeah. about what a challenge that has to be. Now, does, is she on social media? Does she use social media at all, like Instagram, Facebook, and all that? Not Instagram, but she's on Facebook. Okay, yeah. so uh, mm. Katrina doesn't isn't on any platforms, wow. which I think is definitely helped our relationship. Easier that way. It yeah. is, yeah, much easier that it's like, that's my business. Because before, you know, before this happened, before Mind Pump happened, I was never into that stuff. I mean, I think our age group and above is just like, you know, MySpace was coming in as I was like getting older. And, <laughs> and to be honest, and no offense to anybody MySpace here, it's like my jam. when that stuff came out, I already had a bunch of friends. Yeah. So I didn't need any digital ones. Yeah. So I didn't really pay much attention to all those things because I was out doing shit with all my friends in real life that I didn't need those types of tools until we got a business that kind of required that we dove into it. And now I, I find this struggle of learning to separate those times of I'm, I'm in business I'm, I'm, and it looks like I'm scrolling on Instagram and only looking at booty pics. And I tell her all the time, it's like, <laughs> yes, those come in my feed a lot and I, and I do like those, I fitness but, people. I, what? but I, am, I am doing other productive things also in there. But so talk about that, what a dynamic that's been for you guys' relationship, because I know that can be very challenging when somebody has a... Yeah, a your business is based on social media. It right. is. It is. So yeah, you know, having a podcast, obviously, and then uh, having a, a social media platform. Uh, we have uh, what's called the Data Edge Alliance, which is, which is our mastermind community, which that we use Facebook as of right now to to have a forum. So it's, it's a lot of... I mean, the business... Business and social media never sleep because business is social media, you know, mm -hmm. in a space like this. So it, it mm -hmm. is hard to disconnect sometimes. That is one of the issues that that we probably face that that Jessica, like she'll she'll tell me about. But at the same time, I don't take it as a, one thing that Jessica is not. She's not a nagger like she's just not that way. So when she brings something to my attention, I know it's it's legit and I need to pay attention to it. But that is one common theme, you know, it's like, hey, you need to like have have us time, you know, like put put the put the the devices down. That, that's yeah. awesome. It's, you yeah. sound a lot like Katrina. That's kind of how she is. She's not a nagger. So when she does say something, I'm like, oh, fuck. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> OK, I've probably been a little too consumed with this. Yeah. If she's brought it up to me. You know, my, so. my, my girlfriend's business is yeah. on social media also. And one thing that we started doing, she started. I thought it was brilliant. So now we both do it is if you're talking to the other person and they're they start to go on. Just stop talking. And then when they say, well, and say, no, 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 I'll let you finish and yeah. then we'll continue. And it's no anger, no nothing, just, you know, focus on one thing at a time yeah. rather than dividing your attention. And it's effective. If she's talking to me while I'm doing that, she'll stop and she'll, she'll say, okay, you can finish what you're doing. Then I'll realize what I'm doing maybe is not that important mm -hmm. or as important as listening to her. Or maybe it is important. I'll tell her, okay, give me five minutes. And so now we don't, rather than dividing our attention, we're much more, you know, much now, more focused. I want to ask you about your transition from uh, medical device sales, because that's a very lucrative business to be in and to, you know, podcasting. I know for sure the first year or two isn't a very lucrative business. So what was that transition like for you? And was that a difficult decision to give up something like that to do what you're doing now? And how'd that look? Yeah. So, um, I, I haven't broken free of the full-time oh. job yet. Oh, okay. Uh, this will probably be my last year doing this. Uh, I, I could easily break free now. It would be fine. Uh, however, we want certain things set. We, you know, Because I, I think, and this is a good lesson for any entrepreneur. Obviously, there's a lot of entrepreneurs that listen to your show. Um, I believe passion is the fuel, but strategy is the map. Like you have to have, like, I have a ton of passion for what I do. However, you have to have a map and I know exactly what I need to do to get to that point. Cause right now I, ha I have, I have five other people that depend on me besides, besides me. Right. And if you have four boys, one of them is always in the pantry. Mm -hmm. Like our grocery bill alone <laughs> yeah, is man. out of bounds. It's crazy. So, but I will say this, uh, you know, going from, so it, it's been a, it's been a tremendous lesson in business. So yeah, when, when I was a podcaster, it's actually the other way, you know, it was, it was money out because I was paying production right. fees and all this other stuff, you know, then show sponsors came and then I wrote a book. And then in 2016, we started what's called the data edge mastermind and that we had over 200 men go through that 12 week program. Now we have what's called the Data Edge Alliance, which is our mastermind community. And that's just, that's just one of, of a couple of different streams of revenue or several different streams of revenue we have now, but that is, that's a thriving, thriving, thriving group of men. And I can tell you, uh, trying to build that, navigate that. Yeah. It's been no easy task. Mm -hmm. I always say, you know, being an entrepreneur is, is not for the faint of heart, especially if you're a busy father who, you know, people are depending on you. Right. So 
uh, to, I haven't made the transition fully yet, but I, I, the, the next, I would say probably within the next six months will be that. Good for you. Scaling yeah. a business like this is, is really challenging. And I think a lot of people don't, I know, realize it because I think there's a lot of people out there that fake it, yeah. you know, that make it look like, you know, they take pictures, they rent, you know, fancy cars and they take pictures in front of it like they're balling out of control. And in reality, there's there's not a lot of money in this until you do get really, really rolling. Are there some things that you thought would be easier that ended up being more challenging? And what are some of the hurdles that you've had with scaling scaling the business to where it's at now? Yeah, there's definitely been some hurdles. And I will say this, uh, for busy fathers, I feel that you know the past few years of working the nine to five while building a business probably speaks to more men than just diving in head first or feet first. Because I do believe you have to be smarter about it, but scaling it, so, I mean, there's really been not much out there doing how we're doing it. Um, so scaling the business, it's been, I've had to hire business coaches. I've had to put in uh, processes, structure, automation, uh, the whole nine yards to make sure that, so like, for instance, the majority of, of my business is when a, when a new member comes on, you know, a new, a new guy comes on. And I can tell you, if, if that is not simple, if that's not a simple process for a, a man, he's not going to do it. Mm. So making things not only very simple, very easy from the customer experience, also very effective for the customer experience. At the same time on my end where I am not working relentlessly because as an entrepreneur, you can work yourself into a low paying job if you if you don't do it right. Mm-hmm. Explain that. Was that was it like so when you first started, was it kind of clunky to if I oh, yeah. wanted to join your group or whatever like that and it was I had to jump through hoops or it right. was just not a smooth process? Like explain what it was like and then where yeah. you're at now. <laughs> so in 2016, I, I ran into a couple of challenges with it. So it was a 12 week what we called the dad edge mastermind. So what did that mean for me? Every 12 weeks I had to go out and find new clients. Right. And then for my client, that meant that that session was coming to an end. And I had clients that were like, well, what am I supposed to do now? I want to, I want to keep going. What do you have for me? And I didn't have anything for him. Not to mention, uh, I don't think Stripe was available then. And if it wasn't, I didn't know about it. So mm-hmm. I literally sent out manual invoices oh, via wow. Square. <laughs> I just had to track everything on a spreadsheet. Oh, I had God. to send out everything, Ugh. make sure I had certain highlights and colors for guys who had paid and guys who hadn't. It was a nightmare. So I, I really started, it, it, the, the quality of your life depends on the, on the quality of your questions that you ask yourself, right? So I started asking myself, what can I build that will fulfill the need of a man doing something that we do ongoing? It just doesn't end. And how can I streamline that for him? And then also, how can I streamline all the back work for me? And that's when I thought, you know, that's when we we uh, we came up with the Data Edge Alliance, which is it's ongoing; it never ends. You know, it's once he joins, he it it gets billed out automatically. It's deducted from his credit card. Just simple things like that. The other thing too is there's a lot of things, as you guys know, being entrepreneurs, that happen um, behind the scenes. You are the CEO, you're the CFO, you're the sales, you're the marketing, and you're the janitor. You're all those things. I had a business coach of mine tell me, make a list of everything you hate doing, <laughs> everything, and all the things you like to do. And then your next step is to hire out everything you hate doing and focus only in on the things that you like and only the things that will uh, create value, number one, for your, for your current customers, and number two, grow it. And that's what I did. So, it, and it took a lot of, the, like, so podcast production, right? Uh, that's one, that's one. I don't even touch that anymore. I record my show. I have a girl who does all my show notes, all my SEO. I have another guy who, who does all the, uh, the podcast editing and it's literally hands off and it frees up so much mental space, so much time to go out and do things that I really want and need to do. Of course, Mm -hmm. you know, maybe seven or eight years ago, I didn't see or hear of podcasts that would focus on how to be a better father or how to be a better man. There seems to be this explosion in the market with, you know, you have people like Jordan Peterson coming out in his book, seems to attract lots of young men. We have friends in the podcast space like Ryan, Ryan Mitchell, Mishler from yeah. Order of Man, you know, your podcast, which is very successful, and others. Why do, we, why do you think there's this explosion in the marketplace of men seeking out this kind of, I don't know, guidance and information? Men are hungry for it. I mean, without a doubt, but they're quietly hungry for it. If you, if you look at most men, they're not going to be very outspoken about like, 
holy shit, being a father is way harder than I thought. Yeah, you know, men and don't seek help very often. They don't. They don't. The hardest thing for a man to do is say, I don't want I don't know. And especially fatherhood. It's one thing to, you know, to do what you are, do what you do for a living and then seek out coaching for that. I want to make my business better. Help me to do that. Guys will do that all day long. What they won't do is like, I'm not being the best husband right now. I'm not being the best father. I'm not very confident with it. I lose my temper. I lose my patience. I need to be better at it, but I'm sure as hell not going to ask for help for that because then I'm going to look like an inefficient father. I'm going to look like an ineffective father. It's going to be a, a mark on me as a guy. Mm. Do you think it's there also maybe because a whole generation now of men has been has grown up now without uh, male role models and without father? Because you know this has always been a challenge, right? Yeah. Men have always been wanted to be you know better men, better fathers, better leaders and providers. But do you think now it's now today maybe this, there's just more men now who've grown up without that and just. They need that that guidance. It seems like there's a bit of a crisis of, of you know, the crisis of masculinity, if you will. Yeah. So the crisis of masculinity, it's a huge hot topic right now. I think more men are, we see more engaged men in this particular generation than I think any other generation, you know, and yeah, I think that there's a lot of validity to that because guys either grew up without a father or they grew up with a father that maybe wasn't emotionally there. He just kind of went, went out and did the work, came home. Very few, I mean, very few guys that I talk to, you know, it's, I mean, it, the numbers are staggering, but they're very few guys are like, man, I had the best dad. Mm. You know, he was awesome. And I just want to be like him. It's usually the other two. So now we we're seeing, I think more that hungry man who's like, this stops with me. Like this pattern stops with me. I am going to be a better father and it's going to start with me. And I think that's what you're seeing now. Mm. Yeah. How do you coach on that? What are the things that you talk, like, what does it mean to be a, a, a great father? Like, what are the things that you talk about? you know, with your podcast and your mastermind. Yeah. So we focus on five dimensions of, of basically what affects us as men. You know, we have our financial dimension, we have our health dimension, which includes uh, physical, mental, emotional, spiritual health. Uh, we also have the relationship with our wife, whether we're together or not relationship with our kids and then what we do for a living. And what I have found is that those, those five dimensions affect a man in a very profound way. So like, for instance, and what I found is most men are doing pretty well in one or two of those. And then uh, three of them, they're not doing so well. So like, we'll take a guy who's ripped, he's fit, man, his health is in check. You know, he's got confidence, but he's broke, you mm -hmm. know, and, and because he's broke, it's adding so much stress and pressure to his marriage because there is something very real about financial intimacy. That's, that's a real thing. And then we'll have guys who are like, man, they're just as you were saying earlier, balling, right? Mm -hmm. You know, they're making tons of money. They're, they're, they're traveling. They, they, you know, they're, they're just making a, a boatload of money, but they have zero relationship with their wife or kids. Like they haven't had sex with their wives in six months. You know, their kids barely know them, you know, things like that, but financially they're doing great. So what we, what we see is we, we have to figure out first, what dimension are you struggling in and which one are you thriving in? Because that's what we want to give to men. It's like you, you want to give them the keys to the, to the dimensions that they're not doing so well. In. What are the most common dimensions that you're finding? Well, first of before you go that direction, I wanted you to explain financial intimacy. That sounds interesting. Yeah. And I've never heard anyone yeah. say that before. That means you have sex and a pile of money. <laughs> <laughs> that's what went through my head, yeah. right? That's that's just, like, like, just like Scarface. Yeah. Right? Adam's, like, <laughs> Adam's like, I do that all the time. Right. Right. I knew I was on track. Gosh. <laughs> Where'd the hundred dollar bill go, babe? Mind pump media TV. There's a private <laughs> video. <laughs> yeah. So financial intimacy. So 50% of all divorces are caused from financial distress. So there, and, and here's the other thing too. Were you guys taught personal finance growing up? Nope. No, uh -huh. it was not. I was taught to save. Was. I came yeah. from very traditional old yeah. school Italian family. So it was like throw your money in the bank, but that's it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Throw your, don't, don't spend your money. Which is so, better than most people. Yeah. Right. Most exactly. people get nothing. I got nothing. Yeah. yeah. I got zero. But I don't know how to invest. I don't know what interest rates were, credit cards, how they work. Yeah. Like I had to buy, you know, uh, investment products. I got set stuff. up with loans. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that was great. Thanks, mom. Exactly. <laughs> and dad. Borrow everything. Right. Yeah. Yeah, so none of us growing up were ever taught personal finance, ever. You know, so if you think of being a father, being a mother, you're learning that on the fly, right? They're like, oh yeah, here's your kid, best of luck. Same thing with finances. Now you have to navigate the world of finances. And if you're looking at the Joneses, you know, everybody's buying their new cars, their big houses, they're this, they're that. You have no idea what's going on behind the curtain, but what you do know is like, oh, it's the American dream. We just take out a loan for everything. And people are floundering in debt. 
I just heard a statistic. I had uh, Jesse Meekum on, who's the CEO of, of YNAB, which is you need a budget. And he, he's got a, he's got an incredible business, but, um, the majority of 50 year olds, this statistic will blow your mind. The majority of 50 year olds have an average of $50,000 in retirement. And it's not because they haven't been saving. It's because they slowly take out of it year mm-hmm. after year after year to keep up with their spending. Wow. So financial int- intimacy is, if you think about it, creating a vision for what you want your life to really look like if money was not <clears throat> involved. And then understanding, well, what do we want our money to do for us? And then almost deploying every dollar as a soldier as what do you want it to do for you and how do you want it to work for you? Like, so for instance, uh, Jessica and I, we're on the same page financially. We're like, we don't give a shit what car we drive because we know it's going to be filled with goldfish and Cheerios <laughs> and mud and all this other crap. That's some real right? stuff right there. Oh, right? It's, yeah. it's, it's nasty. Four boys. I mean, there's, there's so much dirt and oh, it's man. just crazy. <laughs> so cars aren't a big deal. However, life experiences are a big deal. Christmas presents are not a big deal. A lot of people go nuts. They rack their credit cards during Christmas time on stuff. You know, one thing we're doing for our for our family, for our two boy, our two older boys, and and us is we just bought uh, OAR tickets for St. Louis OAR the band, and we are mm-hmm. actually going to be on stage with them. Oh wow! Yeah, so and, right. and and that's obviously you know there's a pretty penny involved with that. However, we're like this is Christmas, right? We want to give an experience, not stuff that's going to be broken anyway, right? So yeah, cool. creating that vision it gives you financial intimacy. Hmm. So the the question I was asking was what which dimension do you find is the one that's the most common that men are lacking in? Hmm. It's it's all over the board. Really, it's literally all over the board. Every guy has a different situation. Like yep. I said, some guys are just so financially stable, but their marriage is a wreck. Um, it's literally all over the board. Mm. Yeah, I would think that it would be like that, where you're strong in one area, but then you're almost always weak yeah. in another. Is it ever? Do you ever find somebody who's got a who's, super balanced? Yeah, no. I would think that it's you're almost always robbing Peter to pay Paul. And when you talk about five different dimensions, it's got to be pretty tough to kind of crush all five of those. Do you ever come across guys that you think are killing it, or do you even feel like you're killing it in all five departments? It's 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 definitely a challenge. You know, you always feel like you're fighting it to crush it. What we always say is don't try to necessarily crush it, just be balanced in it. Mm-hmm. You know, because there's always going to be teeter-totters, you know, no matter what. You're never going to sit back and be like, oh, I did it. You yeah, know, you're yeah. never, never going to be at that point. However, what I find the most successful men, no kidding around, number one, they take care of themselves first. So they take care of their health. They, they you know, they have a morning routine usually. They meditate, they work out, they're methodical, they're, they're strategic. You know, I mean, as crazy as it sounds, right, they'll literally, they'll, they'll gamify and make goals around spending time with their kids. They'll literally, okay, my goal today is to read my kid a bedtime story and to talk to my 12-year-old today for 10 minutes of uninterrupted, and I'm going to schedule a date with my wife. Like literally when they put pen to paper, when they write things down, when they go, when they make goals around it, those are the guys I see thrive. So it's funny you bring that up because there was a lesson that I learned in leading people. And I share this on our podcast all the time uh, from a book that I read uh, back in my 20s. And something that I started to do with my staff, instead of being a, a manager who was always pointing out the things that you could do better in and that you did wrong and correcting it. I began to focus on all the things that they did well. And the way I had to do that was I actually had to write it. Back then, we had Palm Pilots. So this was before the <laughs> iPhone existed. And in my Palm Pilot, I had all of my staff. And at that time, I think I was managing somewhere between 20 to 30 uh, trainers and front desk and uh, counselors at my place. And I'd have a, a, a a thing scheduled and at like nine o'clock in the morning, the alarm would go off and say, you know, Larry. And I would know to go find Larry, walk over, put my hand on your shoulder and point out something that I thought that you were doing really well. I can see how that would translate into even parenting and fatherhood, right? Where that would be a really valuable tool is to do that as silly as it may sound to give yourself an alarm or write down on a piece of paper a reminder to do stuff. Mm-hmm. I think it would be, it's something that I know, even though I'm not a father, I would apply that same strategy too. Mm. Those are the guys we see thrive. Mm. You know, that literally they're, they're intentional. Mm-hmm. They're purposeful. 
they're methodical, they're strategic. You know, I mean, a lot of guys think that being, oh, I'm a father, it should come naturally to me. I should be able to do this well naturally. Nothing is further from the truth. It is a tough fucking job. Mm -hmm. It's really, really hard. However, if you know how, if you can use those same strategies leading people, I wouldn't even call that managing people. I would call that leading people because that's what you did. Uh, Leading people, same thing with your business. If you can take those same skills and incorporate those into your family, yeah, tremendous Mm -hmm. things happen because what, what is our, what is our usual uh, default? Our default is to find everything wrong our kids are doing, right? Mm -hmm. And we're all guilty of that. However, if you can incorporate something like that, it's tremendous. It's the power. I mean, think about what you did for that employee. Right. Right. I mean, you just made their whole day, their whole week, probably. Imagine what you do to your kids or your family or, or you know, coworkers that you have if you did just those things. Well, oh, your your yeah. kids will either, they're either going to act and behave in ways to avoid upsetting you or yeah. they're going to act and behave in ways to, to impress you. To, yeah. To continue you right. being proud of them and happy with mm-hmm. what they're doing. It's two very different, you know, uh, mentalities mm-hmm. and strategies. It's like, um, it's like a boxer fighting to win versus just fighting to not lose. It's a very different, yeah. different looking fight when you watch somebody on, on, you know, on the TV and you can tell they're just trying to maintain their lead and they don't want to lose versus somebody who's actually trying to go in there and win. Right. So it's kind of similar, you know, with that. Um, I've talked about on our show quite a bit about how much growth I've had personally through podcasting, both through the conversation I have with my co-host, the sharing that I get to do on air, and then the guests. In particular, the guests that we get to meet and how I get to leverage my podcast to meet people who I never would have had the opportunity to meet. Everyone from, you know, Paul Check to Bishop Barron to, you know, uh, you know, people who've started incredible businesses and been very successful. Who have been some of the most impactful guests you've had on, on your show? And have you experienced growth like that? Oh yeah. I, I've so when I first started the podcast three and a half years ago, I was I, I had I always say that I was on God's good humor. You know, for like 10 episodes, I kind of knew what I was going to do. But after that, I was like, "Mm, yeah. And I'll never forget. uh, So it was right around like episode 50. I'd been doing it a year. That's when I really started getting some amazing guests. And it it blew my mind. So one of the first big guests I had was Carlos Condit. Uh, UFC fighter, yeah. uh, but I've had you know Carlos Khan, I've had Jim Miller, Frankie Edgar. Frankie Edgar just came on for a second time. Uh, I just had on. If you guys seen the movie Thirteen Hours, I just had Chris Tanto Peranto mm-hmm. on. Um, and you know I've had, uh, gosh, let me think, the whole gamut of of just amazing guests, uh, Navy SEALs, and I mean just. I've had New York Times bestselling authors like John Eldridge, who wrote, you know, Wild at Heart, and Gary John Bishop, who wrote, you know, Unf Yourself, Unfuck Yourself. And uh, I would say when I first started podcasting, I was like, there's no way that someone, I, I could get somebody on the show that has any type of, you know, clout like that. And it's, it's, it has shocked me because every single person I've ever reached out to to come on the show has said yes, except for one. That I've always wanted to get, and that's Seth yeah. Seth Rogen. Because oh. I'm, yeah, or I'm sorry, um, Seth Gooden. Seth Gooden. Yeah, he he doesn't like talk. He won't talk about his family publicly. Mm. But um, everybody else has just been fatherhood has been such an amazing part of a man's life. What I've noticed mm. is is men are very eager to talk about their experiences mm-hmm. and things that that have been a struggle for them and things that have been good for them. But as far as Incredible lessons. Uh, one came from a guest, uh, Aaron Walker, who's uh, his best friend is Dave Ramsey. Uh, they're really, really tight. They've known each other for 25 years. Don't come home with a wallet full of money and a house full of strangers. That's one thing that- Ooh, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, that was that was big. Um, Frankie Edgar just came on. He talked about the importance of always dating your wife. You know, that's, that's something that we talk about all the time. Uh, I would say- uh, an, another lesson is being being the example, you know, because your kids are always watching you. I just had on Christopher Voss, who wrote the book Never Split the Difference. He was the FBI chief hostage negotiator for years, and he talked about the importance of allowing your kids to make mistakes and pay for them themselves. He's like, your instinct is to always you know, protect your kids Mm -hmm. from failure or from heartache. He's like the best thing you can do. The best lesson you can give them is to allow them to go through the pain of making a poor decision because life is going to hand them just a variety of different challenges. And if you coddle them, if you protect them, 
you're, you're not doing your job. Oh, man, failure is a great teacher. Are you kidding yeah. me? What do you think about this current generation of kids that get trophies for – just, just entering into a, a you know competition yeah, or showing up, not, or or not keeping score. I couldn't believe my daughter was in a basketball league, and she you know she's eight years old, so it's a bunch of little kids, and they're playing basketball, and there was no score. Nobody kept score. They were just trying to make the basket. I'm like, why? What do you guys? They need the losers need to know that they lost so they can learn from it. Otherwise, what the hell is the purpose of of playing this you know this game? What do you think about that? I hate it. I absolutely hate it. Um, Every pro athlete, we, we've had a, a variety of pro athletes come on come on the show. One thing that I can honestly say about all, because I've asked that question to the pro athletes, you know, how do you get to this level? You know, what was your childhood like playing sports? And the work ethic that was instilled in these guys who are in the NFL or the UFC or whatever else they're doing, they were like, participation trophies? No, <laughs> absolutely not. One guy actually told me that his dad threw his participation trophy away. Mm-hmm. And he was like, you need to earn this. You can't. He's like, this doesn't happen in my Sounds house, like in our me. house. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so my, my three, my, uh, my two oldest boys, they wrestled for three years. My young, my 10 year old was a gifted wrestler, worked his ass off. Uh, he was second in state with wrestling has medals galore. Right. And my older one, he, you have to finish in the top three of every wrestling tournament to get a medal. And it would always crush my older one to come home without a medal, which was pretty often. And he was just like, well, don't I get a medal for being there? I'm like, no, <laughs> you have got to earn. So like, let's, let's train harder, you know, let's, let's work harder, you know? And that was, but yeah, that's the mentality giving everybody a participation trophy. I just, I don't agree with that. No, I think it's terrible because you, what do you want? You, you want to raise strong kids at some point. They're not going to be in your, under your roof. Right. You're not going to be able to protect them. How the hell are they going to deal with the real world that doesn't give a shit if you participated and sucked? Nobody cares if you participate. If you show up at work and you suck, you're not going to leave with an award. Right. You're going to get fired. Yeah. Like you know what's that old what's that old sales movie? Glen Gary, Glen Ross. Yeah. Yeah. What is it? First place at Cad- Cadillac Eldorado. Second place set of steak knives. Third place is you're fired. Yeah. <laughs> That's life. Yeah. yeah. You know yeah. what I'm saying? I think it's crazy that what what people are doing with their kids and they're so afraid to tell them. You know, my, my, my kid is here today with us. He's not he's obviously summertime. And so he's, he was in the back doing inventory and he was trying to vacuum up in the front and he's, he's working with us. And he's a very, very good student. He tries very, very hard at school, usually gets straight A's. Every once in a while, he'll bring home a test where, you know, it's like a B or something like that. And he'll bring, he'll show me the thing and he'll wait to see what my response is. And I'll say to him, well, are you satisfied with this grade? Do you think this is the grade that you earn? And, you know, his response is, well, I tried hard. I said, but do you think you could have gotten a better grade? And you'll say, yes. And I'll say, okay, are you satisfied with what you got? How do you feel about the score that you got? And you can see his wheels turning, you know, because I also, I'm not trying to make the case that being the best is the only thing that matters because you'll never be the best. There's always somebody better than you. But applying yourself is what matters and caring about that is what matters. And just showing up, shit, man, we're, you know, nobody owes you anything. I think that's absolutely insane how people, how people, uh, at least society today, tries to do that. Do you guys talk about this kind of stuff with the with the dads and your masterminds? Is this a common belief that you're finding, or do you think are there a lot of dads who are thinking, no, they need to get a trophy just for showing up? I think if you talk to most dads, they get pissed at that. They don't like that because it it rewards uh, show exactly what you said, showing up. No one's going to give you a reward for going to work. I, yeah, I don't. I don't feel like a bunch of dads got together and made that rule. You know what? Yeah. I think. You know what? That's funny you say that. I, I think that was. You know what? That's a reflection of. That's what? a reflection of a, of societies that are growing up, or generations that are growing up without dads. I tell you that right now, a hundred percent. I think that's. And this is no knock on moms because I think moms, moms are there when dads aren't most of the time. Yeah. Okay, that's the bottom line. And moms are. Uh, I mean, they're they're your moms. I mean, they're, they're they should be held up on a pedestal. But I do think that's a reflection on a, a, a lot of dads not being present. A lot of moms, you know, saying, "Hey, we can't have, you know, kids winning and losing because that hurts everybody's feelings." Right. I really think that may be a reflection of that. You that's, know. Yeah. There's something that's called that's called life. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Has any of your guests shocked or surprised you, where you would expect one thing and you get something totally different? Uh, let me think. So I had, like I said, I had, uh, Chris Tonto Peranto on the show. And one of the things that, um, that he said, man, this one just blew me away. Uh, swallowing your ego and swallowing your pride and asking for help 
can be one of the most powerful things that we can do. And this guy, you know, he survived Benghazi for 13 hours. You know, he's a, he's a, he's an army ranger. I mean, this guy is like one of the baddest dudes on the planet. Right. And he was talking about how he was going through the 75th Ranger Battalion training and how hard it was. And he just, he just crushed it, crushed training. And then there was one guy uh, at the end and you look at somebody like Chris, like he's like, you know, he's, he's an elite warrior. Like this guy never has a bad day. Right. He's in great shape. He's mentally tough. So when he was going through his training, uh, the 75th Ranger Battalion, he just, he was crushing it. Training was going awesome. On the very last day, they had like an 18 mile ruck. You know, this was their last thing. They're doing calisthenics and he had all kinds of gear on. He had his gun, he had his, his gun on, he had his rucksack and he was dying at like eight miles in. He was like, I, I don't know if I'm going to make it. Like he was just dying. So there was a guy who was really overweight, barely made it through anything. And Chris was just on this guy's ass all through training. And, uh, at the very last day, this guy, this, this overweight guy, you know, who was training right next to him goes, give me your gun. And Chris was like, I've been pushing your ass ever since day one. How am I going to give you my gun? He's like, you're not going to make it. You're not going to make it. You don't make it. You don't graduate. It'd be really horrible if you didn't graduate in the last thing that we had to do. So Chris reluctantly gave him his gun to carry. And this thing weighed like, I think, 40 pounds. And he was already carrying another 40, 50 pounds on his back along with all his gear. He ended up making it. But he said that the biggest life lesson was to swallow your pride and ask for help when you need it. Because most men don't do that. Mm -hmm. And that's such a lesson for guys because the hardest thing that we do is raise our hand and ask for help. We would much rather live a quiet life of desperation and isolation and just being miserable before we're like, I just need some fucking help. Isn't that funny about us yeah. men? Yeah. It, it takes, yeah. a, well, it it's takes a, a, a more strength and confidence, real confidence yeah. um, to ask for help than it does to not. Yeah. That's, that's the truth. I think it takes a bigger man to say, Hey, I can't do this, man. You want to give me a hand? Yeah. Then somebody who's just afraid to do that. So right. I, I think what happened, I think we tend to, you know, we internalize it and we confuse ourselves and say, well, I, you know, asking for help is going to make me weak. No, you're weak because you're afraid to ask for help. Why don't you show some strength and confidence yeah. and admit that you, 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 you can't do something alone. I think there's a, there's a big lesson in that. I learned right. that, you know, early in my personal training career, I learned, when I first became a trainer, was I was afraid to ask for help because I don't want or tell my clients I didn't know something because I had to know everything. And about a, a year in or so, I realized well, I get more respect when I say I don't know, but I'll find out. Um, and then I grow and learn anyway because there's a lot of people out there. Most people out there know more than you do. That's that's the well. That's on the on that note, do you, is there do you see other common themes with the struggles that men and fathers go through? Like that, obviously being one, right? Is there other common themes? And I know we said earlier that with the five dimensions, there's a lot of individual variances, and you've seen it all. But you know, you've worked with so many guys now. Looking back, do you see like a lot of common mistakes that we tend to make or traps we fall into? Oh my God, yeah. So I can almost I've had I've been blessed to have I don't even know how many conversations at this point, one on one in a group or at a speaking event or whatever else. Uh, I can almost say things before before the man does at this point. I'm like, what do you what do you struggle with most? Patience. You know, patience is a big one. Now, patience. The reason that men are short on patience is because that we tend to internalize so much. You know, we bear the weight of the world on our shoulders. We think we have to do it all. We're into this like whole, like I'm a lone wolf, you know, going through the deserts of Las Vegas, cocaine and hookers. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, Little hangover yeah, reference there. Shout out to hangover. <laughs> no, but I think uh, most men are like, oh, I, I need to be a lone wolf. I need to be alone. And wh what happens, do you guys know what happens to the lone wolf when a, lo when a wolf leaves the pack? What happens? He dies. He dies. Mm. He dies. The, the wolf leaves the pack to go die. And if he's lost his pack, he's going to die. That's sooner or later what's going to happen. But men think lone wolf. They think of strength. It's actually the, the extreme opposite. The wolf is strong because of the pack, and the pack is strong because of the wolves that are in it. So we have to remember that as men. And men, we are community beings. We're tribal beings. You know, if, if we are not surrounding ourselves with the right men in our life, that's going to be detrimental. And so we talk about patience. We talk about temper. Guys have a problem usually with temper. And it's usually a manifestation of we try to take on so much and we have zero outlet. We don't have like that board of advisors. We don't have those men in our life to talk about these things. And I'm not talking about 
being frou-frou and mushy and all this other stuff. Like I want to talk about my feelings. I'm like, Hey, look, like I'm perfect example of finances. Like this is where, you know, a guy would be like, Hey, I'm not having the best situation right now in my marriage and financially we're a bit of a mess. Like, how are you, how are you guys doing it? How are you making it? You know, having that open discussion. Cause if you think about what men talk about, we talk about like the same four things over and over and over. We talk about what we do for a living, what our kids did on the weekend, you know, the current events, what Trump's doing, all this other stuff. It's very, very surface stuff. But I mean, if men had that outlet, if they had that group of guys that they could really dive into it, they could, if they had that board of advisors, that's where you see a man really start to take more control over his temper, take more control over his patience level, things like that. Cause that, that, that's what they struggle with a ton is, is patience, internal dialogue, negative talk, all kinds of things. There seems to be a growth too of actually not seems it's a statistic now of uh, more and more, men not wanting to get married and not wanting to start a family. So more and more men saying, I don't want kids and I don't want to get married. Do you think that's a good or a bad thing? I don't think it's a good thing. Uh, but I think it's it's an individual decision. But if you look at, so I just had Garrett White on the podcast. You guys know who he is? Mm. Wait, wake no. Up Warrior, okay. Warrior book. Uh, so he talks about millennials and not wanting to be married and not wanting to have kids. And he always talks about like, well, a lot of millennials, if you look at it, uh, they haven't really been taught work ethic. They haven't really been taught relationships. Like their education has been on a, on a social platform, on a device platform. You know, they're in front of screens all the time. You know, their, their definition of a relationship is I could swipe right if I'm interested or swipe left if I'm not, and I can go hook up. It's almost like, where's the motivation to have a deep, meaningful relationship when you can just go on a on a whatever and on a, on an app and swipe and go hook up. So like, yeah, there isn't a whole lot of motivation to, for, for millennials or younger people. Now I'm going to play devil's advocate with that because a great book, iGen that I read not just too long ago talks about part of the reason for that statistic, Sal is because we are more informed at this, the younger generation is more informed than they were before and they're wiser because they actually would follow up with those kids and ask a lot of them, Mm. why are you not? And they'd say, well, statistically, I could, you know, at 50-50 shot. It's destined shot. to fail. Yeah, yeah, it's destined to fail. Yeah. or and, they, and so because they're more aware of that. So it's a side effect of what's happened. Right. So the, some of them are, and, and that's not, that's, again, that's an overgeneralization, but I do think there's another side of the coin that could be a positive thing that this generation coming up now has access to information like that. They can get in a podcast and listen to experienced older dads talk about all the challenges of parenting and fatherhood and being in a marriage. And so they're more informed and so maybe a little bit wiser to, hey, maybe I should wait a little longer before I decide well, to get it's into Well, it's a trend that's happening in all, all modern Western societies. And it seems to be the more prosperous and wealthy and successful, the less uh, children people want to have and the marriage percentage tends to drop. I know America's birth rate, rate is at the absolute minimum that is required to sustain a, a functioning society. Many European countries are below to the point where they can never recover. Japan is below to the point where I think it's like in 10 or 20 years, they're going to have more people over the age of 60 than they will, uh, you know, younger than that, which that's scary. Who's going to take care of, who's going to take care of things? So it's a very interesting, you know, um, it's an interesting trajectory and it may pose some kind of new problems. Funny though, the percentage of women that don't want to have families and get married is also growing, but not nearly at the at the rate of men. The male percentage is what's growing the fastest. I mean, I guess we could all speculate as to why that may be. One of my speculations is this: there's no more rites of passages. So, and here's the thing: what I mean by that is, women have a natural rite of passage, which is their biological clock, right? So they they know like, okay, if I don't if I want to have kids and I don't have them in this before this period of time, the odds I'm going to be able to have one are much, much smaller to the point where it won't be able to happen. A guy's you know, clock is much longer. You can wait till you're 45, 50 if you want, 60, and you can still have kids. And so I think, this is my own personal you know, opinion, it's kind of this Peter Pan syndrome where guys are like, ah, you know, I'll just have sex with a bunch of girls and just go out and make money. And you know, I, I have all kinds of time in the world. And it, and it feels like that. And there's no other rites of passage, you know what I mean? Whereas before we had other rites of passage. Do you create anything like that for your boys, by the way? Do you have any rites of passage for them that 
where you say, okay, now you're this age and this is what happens or, or now? It's funny you mention that because right now, so like growing up without a father or like the craziness that I grew up with, I didn't have that rite of passage. So I have a son right now who's 12 and he is becoming a man, you know, and I'm sitting here scratching my head. I'm like, I really need to have something for him. I need to do something for him to give him that experience of, Hey, you're no longer like you are a boy, but you are turning into a man. The answer to that question right now is no, but I am searching for that because I think it's important. And I got three other, you know, right behind him that I, I want to do something to allow him to enter that next part of his life in a profound way. And I also, I, I think it's important. I, I think there's something that mentally clicks, especially with young boys, you know, like I'm, I'm becoming a man now, mm. you know, and I think they start to make different decisions. They start to look at life a little bit differently, you know? So yeah, I'm, I'm in the process. What of did, what did Ryan of order, man? What, I know he talked about his with his yeah. boy. Yeah, what what was his some, process? He did some pretty fascinating ones. Like he, I think I forgot what the ages were, but he would take his son camping and you know, mm-hmm. at a certain age, they got the first, you know, 22, like you know, weapon, rifle yeah. or yeah. they got to hunt or, you know, it, things that he picked that were kind of like, Hey, and I don't think it matters really what it is. I think if you just, you can pick traditional things or not, but I think sitting down and, and, and having that conversation and telling them, you know, because like, again, like it's the lesson behind it that yeah, really matters. Right? You, know, like, boys and, you know, boys and girls grow up and both go through puberty, but a girl gets her period. So she gets that conversation. She gets that conversation. Like what's happening to my, like, really, this is like a kind of a, a rite of passage. And then again, that biological clock, you know, what does a guy get? You know, we get pubes and what, like, you know, there's really nothing that we sit down and say, Hey. This is what it means. Uncomfortable boners. Yeah, like exactly. <laughs> you, you, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. what does this mean? And, you know, what it means to be a man type of deal. And then again, the fact that a lot of kid, boys are growing up without dads. Yeah. So they kind of don't, you know, they kind of don't have that. How do you, how do you police like uh, social media right now? Because they're coming to that age too where they probably have. Yeah, that's a good question. Pornography is a big, that's a big worry of mine with, you yeah. know, my son's 13 years old. He's on the internet. Like, do you, do you have any strategies to deal with that? Right now, this is, I wouldn't say it's the right answer, but it's the answer we have right now. So they, they don't have phones yet. My, they're 12 and 10. They're, of course, they want a phone. Which is totally okay because yeah. I didn't get my fucking first phone until I was like 20. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So <laughs> well, I don't think they had They'll phones. survive. Yeah, I don't right. think they had cell phones when no, you were we had the Nokia, <laughs> they had the Nokia snake phone when I was in high school. Oh, okay. I had a pager. You know what I'm saying? That's so right. Get them a pager. Pager. <laughs> the pager. <laughs> Why are you not home? Yeah. 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 <laughs> no, so they don't have, but they do have, um, they have iPads, right? So I just had uh, Cameron Adir on the show, and he is the world's expert on devices, screens, video games, oh, internet, interesting. YouTube, and what it does to a kid's brain at these certain ages. And it was like, holy shit. Like, parents, if you guys are listening right now and you have a kid, you have we have no idea what we're up it's against. It's a huge experiment. Yeah, mm-hmm. we have no idea what we're up against. It is a freaking monster, right? And when I had Cam on, I was like, holy shit. This show is actually, my show with him is coming out in September, but I was like, this blew my mind. So to answer your question, right now, we anything that they go view on YouTube, so it's connected to my account so I can see it. Mm. They are only allowed to be on 30 minutes of screen time per day, and that's it. Uh, as far as like the sex conversation, so like rite of passage, like, I mean, yeah, you know, so I, I took my boys shooting that kind of thing. We also, we had the sex conversation. Uh, so I, I did bring them up, up to speed on all that. But as far as like pornography, I just had an expert on um, how to explain porn to your kids on the show. Mm. And she wrote a book called Good Pictures, Bad Pictures. And to be honest, I've been at this point a little too chicken shit to actually sit down and read them that book because... I'm like, what am I going to open up here? Because eventually what's going to happen? Yeah, they, they're going to get curious. And right. Want I think they're, Sal's going through the same thing right now, right? Yeah, like, yeah. You, how much of it do you want to share? Because you feel like your boy's got a, some innocence to him still. Too. Yeah, it's a, it's an it's interesting problem because when I when we were kids, oh, yeah. okay, do you remember how valuable one dirty magazine was? Oh, it was crazy. I, I could, I could not making this up. More than I know, gold. I know kids that traded their bikes for dirty magazines, okay? <laughs> you porn is so it's so accessible now. It's yeah. like no you it's all free. You know, nobody pays for it and it's all out there. And there and you can literally go through endless pictures whenever you want. And it literally changes the way your brain is wired to the yes. point now where erectile dysfunction is growing. The fastest age group that eight that erectile dysfunction is is growing is in the 20-year-old age group. Yeah. Erectile dysfunction. Yeah. That never existed in 20-year-old males. Right. Or at least it was super rare, or it was connected to some health problem. 
Now you've got, you know, this growing percentage of kids that are like... Oversaturation. Yeah, it's just too much. The only time ever in human history where a man or a boy or whatever would be exposed to that level of variety would be in the extremely rare case that they were like a king or something like that or, you know, the leader of a, you know, massive tribe, Genghis Khan. Like, you never had that kind of access before. Changes the way the brain is wired, so it's actually quite dangerous. It's actually not it's crazy dangerous. Yeah, it's not just being a puritan. It's not like yeah. oh, don't look at porn because it's it's dirty. It's like this is a, a health thing that you gotta. And, and when the brain changes at that age because it's constantly molding, there could be potential for permanent, you know, more long lasting type changes in the brain. What so. were some of the takeaways from that guest? That sounds like a very interesting guest. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So here here's the thing. I mean, you can police this all day long in your own house, right? But eventually my kid's going to go to his friend's house. Check this out, yeah. right? right? Right. So, you know, I'm getting to that point now where I'm like, I really need to sit down. Not, he knows all about sex. Funny thing is, is he knows that we have sex, which is kind of funny. But <laughs> <laughs> that's a whole nother part. Did you hear you guys <laughs> noises? Or, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, you guys want to hear That's really already quick happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Here's a really quick funny story. So the, it was like a month and a half ago. We were, you know, we were in the bedroom doing our thing, doors locked. And of course, this is when you feel like a really great father, right? So it's like 1130 at night and it's summertime. So the kids are up late anyway. So we're just, we're trying to get some time and we hear a knock, you know, knock, knock, knock. And we're like, yeah. Uh, and they're like, hey, uh, dad, I'm scared. It's all right. You'll be fine. <laughs> you'll be good. Let's go upstairs. But dad, I'm really, a flashlight. Yeah, I'm really scared. It's all right. We'll talk about it in the morning. So that's when you're like, wow, I just totally like, and then. To add insult to injury, that was my 12-year-old. My 10-year-old comes down. He loves to draw, like loves to draw. He's very proud of his drawing. <laughs> Knock on the door. Dad, Dad, I just drew this cool picture. Can we see it in the morning? Yeah, but I, I really want to show you now. And I'm like, no, not right now. We'll see it in the morning. <laughs> so like, and then he's like, continues to do it. I'm like, just go upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> so Slide it under the door. <laughs> right. <laughs> so the next day, no kidding around, is where you feel like total shit as a parent. And the boys come to us. And my son was like, I was really scared. I, I cried last night to sleep. And I'm like, and then my 10-year-old, he's like, I cried too. You didn't want to see our drawing, my drawing. And I'm like, oh. so me and Jessica talked about it. You're like, they know about sex. Like, it's probably just, it's at this point, it's probably healthy for them. To know that, right. that explain that, what mommy and daddy are doing, well, right? But but even from like a boundary standpoint, like look, there is time when when you are not invited, okay? <laughs> like, and there needs to be an understanding there, you know. So <laughs> we sat him down. I think we scarred him for life because we told him we were like, look, we're just gonna be honest with you guys. When you came and knocked, we're like, we didn't mean to hurt your feelings. All right, we know you guys both cried yourself to sleep. We're sorry, but mom and dad were having sex, and they were like. What? <laughs> That's disgusting. Why are you still doing yeah. that? I already have My three brothers. Bleeding. Right. I already yeah. have three brothers. You don't need to do that anymore. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the, their so next they question. cried uh, that night as well. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, their next question was, well, did you make a sister? Because we need a sister. <laughs> These four boys. So, you know, we told them, we told them, but there's boundaries and all that other stuff. But with the whole porn thing, um, I, I, I think it's just, God, it's, it's up to that point where like, I have no idea what I'm up as a father, what I'm up against here because I'm like, God bless. Like there's an arsenal of just, as you were saying, like just free shit out there waiting for him to click on the wrong site. So I think what I'm going to do with him is just be the one thing we've always been with the boys. Obviously we tell him what happens is just being very real with him. Mm -hmm. Like, Hey, porn is not a good thing. I'm not going to do it that way. I want to, I want to make sure that he knows the real consequences of like, look, if you get into porn, Here's what it does to your mind, okay? Mm-hmm. Like, it's one thing to look at porn, but over time, this is what it, and if you want to be with a girl sexually, guess what? You know, your penis may or may not work because you've looked at too much porn. Just scare the shit out of them. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, kind of, yeah. It might I mean, fall off. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's yeah. what I told my son. <laughs> yeah. You'll yeah. go bald. Yeah, no, you know, you know, when I think about it, I think to my, because this was a big thing. I was like, okay, how do I talk? Because I know what we were told, like your hands will, you'll grow hair, you know, on the palm of your hands, you'll go blind, like all the, that didn't stop me at all. No, right. You'll yeah, right. you not. You're like, so, I'm still good. I'm yeah, all right. working yeah, no, out. Nah, fuck it. I don't give a shit if I grow hair on my palms. This is cool. <laughs> so what I, one thing that I try to do with, with my boy, Boys, rather than because I'll tell them that too, but I also try to be very honest because there's a reason why people look at it. You know, it's like we had the drug conversation, same thing. Why do people do drugs? You know, I can that can scare the hell out of them, but I'm also going to tell them because they feel good and that's why people do them. And yeah. here's why people get addicted. One thing that I've done is I just I really hammer home the the difference between a relationship yeah. and how much more valuable it is and how it's in a completely different universe than just you know sexual pleasure. 
very, very different. And so that way, at least he'll he can weigh the two and understand like, okay, when I'm with a girl and I build that relationship mm -hmm. um, and have that connection, that's going to be way, way more valuable than just this momentary pleasure. Yeah, it's indulgences, of. right? It's a, yeah. And we talk about that too, even with food and like like having sweets and, and you know, desserts and all these types of things. Like, yeah, of course, you know, treat, like there's going to be treats and there's going to be times where, you know, <laughs> but but if you ate that every single day and like and, and you were just obsessed with this the same treat you're eating over and over, it's really going to affect your body in a well, negative way. It's yeah. so funny in our, in our space, in the health and fitness and wellness space, we have... There's, you know, of course, how you work out, how you eat, and it's all around fitness and, and diet. It's all around like sacrifice, right? Like sacrifice, you know, if you don't eat the cake today, you're, you're going to be healthier and feel better tomorrow. And if you sacrifice some time with exercise, you'll make more time yourself and you'll feel better. But then there's this movement with sex, which is crazy to me that the people don't see the parallels. We're like, yeah, just open, just be open, have sex with everybody. We're and everybody. wired to just and, bang everybody. Yeah, and I'm like, <laughs> yeah. I'm like, you don't see the different, like, you don't see it's the same thing, like yeah. sacrifice for the for for this much more valuable thing versus just indulging yourself all the time. It's no different than somebody coming to you and saying, you know, I'm 100 pounds overweight, but it's because I enjoy my life and I eat whatever I want. Are you really enjoying your life? Is that really bringing you value? And so it's it's funny to me in our space how people are can be so. Not consistent. With Larry, I want to ask. I want to mm. ask you if you could go back and give yourself advice, so that the younger you, who's uh, about to get married, okay, so you've met Jessica, you're about to get married. What's the single bit of advice would you give yourself about what you're about to head into? Ooh, wow, that is a really good question. I think the advice, if I had to sit down with my 28 year old self about to get married, had no idea that I would have four boys. Like in my mind, I thought we'd have two. We have four, which is a lot. It's crazy. That's, that's <laughs> twice as many as you yeah, thought. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Jim Gaffigan's got you this. Doubled. <laughs> yeah. Jim Gaffigan's got this hilarious joke about having four kids. He's like, you know, having four kids is like, just imagine that you're drowning. And then someone hands you a baby. That's what it's like. <laughs> That's true. That's brilliant. Yeah. Oh, so maybe I, I I would put that in there as the advice, you know, to bring a life jacket into that situation. But you no, know, the advice that I would give myself, without a doubt, is do not live a quiet life of desperation and solitude as a husband and as a father and as a man. When you need help, fucking ask for it because you will need help at every corner, at every turn. You will need help and there will be every single part of you that won't want to ask for help because you you feel that you're going to look weak and vulnerable and that is so fucking untrue. It is the lie that we tell ourselves as men and fathers. If I ask for help, I am weak. If I ask for help, it's it's a it's a stamp on me that I am not equipped, that I'm not up to the job. And that is absolutely not true. The other thing I would give myself advice on is to have quality friendships with other men. And the, and the most important word here is like-minded men. You know, you, you, we have, we all have our guys that we hung out with in college, you know, the good old boys go out, kick back a few beers uh, you talk about the same five things that we always talk about. It is so important. It it literally makes or breaks life as as fathers and men that we do not live alone. That you you expose yourself to men that have the same like minded, the same goals, the same like mindedness that you do. This the same strategies to live a fulfilling life with purpose, with your family, with your wife, with what you do for a living. Most importantly too, men that will challenge you, that will challenge your thinking, you know, cause a lot of times, and you guys deal with this, people have to get out of their own way. Mm -hmm. We are at times our biggest obstacle, but if you could just, for, for you guys and what you do, you know, you, you give people, your clients, people that work with you a tap on the shoulder, say, don't keep going straight, go that way because it's going to be much more effective, much more efficient. You're going to get the results that you want. It's the same thing with men. And that's the advice I'd give myself. Excellent. Excellent. Advice, man. Well, yeah, I think you're doing a good thing with your, yeah, with your podcast Thank and you. your show and uh, looking ahead, anything, any goals for the future for what you're doing? Yeah. So as I, as I look ahead, uh, you know, I will be 
doing this full time, you know, and, uh, you know, the podcast and, and the mission and, uh, you know, our goal is to, my goal is to help as, as many men live these fulfilling, purposeful lives as possible. Excellent. Excellent. Well, thanks for coming on the show, brother. Thank you. Great meeting you. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now, plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump. <laughs>